I think it's a very nice concept in the sense that we, what you have there is that as soon as the chick is born and they don't all hatch at the same time, and there's, there's, there's a hatch window, but uh, the ones that are first born in the hatcher, they will have to wait to eat and drink. Whereas in this system, they can, they are, um, after pipping, eh, they come out of the egg, they relax, and then when they're ready for it, they will go eat and drink. So that is the big advantage. Hello and welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Bobek, and today I'm here with Dr. Hilda von Mierhardt. She is a DDM, and she's going to talk to us today about some of the areas that she works in. Welcome to the show, Dr. Hilda. Hello. Nice to greet you all. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to talk today about some of uh, Dr. Hilda's areas of expertise, but first I would like to hear, how did you get into poultry? What's your story? I was actually born in the middle of a poultry family. Yeah? Um, there's lots of pictures when we were small with small chicks and so on. So my father was also a poultry vet. Uh, the family of my mother, they had a small uh, layer integration. Um, my dad selected his own uh, chicken, Derko, which is not existing anymore, but was a small layer, very adapted to like Africa, for example, uh, making smaller eggs, but uh, very performant. Um, and yes, then I wanted to become a vet. Um, and I said, I will never work in poultry because I've seen so many chickens already. I will do cattle and sheep and all that. And I did. But finally, I did end up back where I belong, in Pulci. Oh, that, that is such a fun story. So it, it sounds like you've kind of got poultry in your blood. It's a, a family adventure. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, also a nice world to work in, I would say, uh, because it's um, in all the... Um, animal productions, um, the animal uh, that are bred for production, it is probably the, the field that is most working preventive because once ah. your flock is sick, it's too late. Eh? So I think poultry veterinary medicine is very advanced and always looking for innovations. Eh? Like right now, we are hoping to have a an avian influenza vaccine soon. Eh? So things have to go progressive and mainly prevention. And eh? so vaccines, biosecurity, all that. Yeah, that that's a really interesting uh, way to think about poultry medicine that I haven't thought about before. Um, so, so in your job as a poultry veterinarian or a, a poultry consulting veterinarian, um, I know that you do a lot of work in hatcheries and you've done a lot of work with early feeding. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that is working in Europe since I, it seems like you're very advanced compared to some of the research going on worldwide? Well, there's um, in yeah, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, there's for some years already, uh, we have these uh, on-farm hatching that has become and is becoming more and more popular and advanced. Uh, different systems uh, you have um, sometimes you have to change the the infrastructure in the house but you also have systems that are flexible and that you don't need to change and so the the poultry farmer can decide this flock I will have it in-house uh, hatching and the next one I will just do conventional I will buy the old chicks so there's different, uh, each of these system, in my opinion, has his uh, advantages and disadvantages. If you work with a system that is in the house inbuilt, it's also will need more or give can give more problems with cleaning and disinfection. Um, 
if you have uh, there's a system that lays the eggs in the house and uh, because the idea of of this on farm hatching is that you uh, hatch them well you you put them in the incubator and uh, in the setter for the first 18 days and then at transfer you remove the non fertiles usually or often now you do in ovo vaccination and then you put the eggs in uh, the barn eh? and the barn is heated up uh, like it would be in the hatcher. The advantage of this in-house hatching is that in the hatcher, it's a small, um, well, the machine is, is, is limited, eh? whereas in, in the poultry house, it's much bigger. Eh? There's, there's more volume. So even if you have an infection, it will be diluted. We try not to have infections, of course, eh? but if you have, okay, let's say one disease, Aspergillus, that is very, we don't like it in the hatchery, but if you have it and it's in your hatcher, it will infect all the eggs in your hatcher and they will get a high dose. Eh? It's, I'm talking Aspergillus, but it could be E. coli as well. Eh? If you do it in the house, eh? Again, I'm not saying that we try to, uh, but the, the effect of, of the bigger volume in the house will dilute whatever pathogen that you have there. So that is one advantage. Of course, you have to heat the house eh? three days before. That's a cost. Um, and then the expertise of the hatchery manager has to be taken over partly by the farmer. He has to be around these eggs. Eh? They they need care. Eh? Like in the hatchery, it's in the machine and there's alarms and all that. Eh? But there are devices that they put on the eggs. Eh? It's like ovo scan that will measure the temperature of the eggshell, that humidity and so on. And if there's something wrong, eh? it's, it's uh, uh, connected to a computer, uh, that can be seen or in the hatchery or that the farmer can also follow on his cell phone. Right? So it takes some time before and, and uh, the farmer also has to, in each house you have different areas that are m maybe not so well ventilated or have issues. Eh? So those are things that the farmer has to follow up. Eh? But I think it's a very nice concept in the sense that we... What you have there is that as soon as the chick is born and they don't all hatch at the same time, and there's there's of, there's a hatch window, but uh, the ones that are first born in the hatcher, they will have to wait to eat and drink. Whereas in this system, they can they are um, after pipping, eh? they come out of the egg. They relax, and then when they're ready for it, they will go eat and drink. So that is the big advantage. And what we also know and from research as well is that with this early feeding, the development of the intestines is starting earlier and also the immune system, because that goes together. And finally, what you get is that we talk a lot about eh, the integrity of the intestine, eh, but the first thing to happen is that the tight junctions have to close. Eh, so that, and that happens more early with this um, early feeding system, or well, it, because early feeding is not only on farm hatching, there's other systems, but that is one of the advantages of early feeding. So um, when you yeah, when you first describe how the eggs are, the last three days are incubated in a building, um, I sort of had this different vision than when you said the birds could actually go and get feed and water. So are are the eggs kind of set down in pallets all on the ground, and then once they hatch, the birds can kind of walk around? Is that that's the system with a very warm room, of course. What, what do you want to know now, in the hatcher or in the farm? Um, so at the at the farm, uh, okay. If, so in if the hatcher, nobody is yet. Yeah. Okay. So then there's different systems, and eh? you can put trays 
in the on on a small thing that is elevated eh? you can put the trays and then when they hatch they fall through right eh? uh, that system exists in a flexible system or not eh? but that means that you have air circulation under the eggs as well that's one system another one is where you put the eggs directly on the be bedding and that is done by a robot and the robot comes into the house and they, it can lay like 40,000 eggs in one hour. Another system is small boxes, uh, carton boxes. Uh, the system is called uh, one to born. And um, there you put the eggs in a small tree uh, that has holes around so that there's also a possibility of circulation. And afterwards, these trays can be removed, but you can also leave them for the birds to play with. That's one of the things. Eh? Um, one thing of this on-farm hatching is that, of course, you need to remove the eggs that do not hatch. It's like that also in, in, in the conventional hatchery. Eh? There's always eggs that, for some reason, the chick cannot come out. Eh? But those contain live embryos. Eh? So for welfare reasons, you have to remove them and then euthanize them, in fact, or well, dispose of them in a, in a way that you kill the embryo. So that is one of the things that is an extra work for the farmer. Because as I say, there's pro and cons. Eh? Uh, not every farmer is willing to do this. Eh? It's more, it'd be, some prefer to have the eggs from the hatchery. Also, farmers sometimes don't have time. Eh? Uh, they have other uh, work to do in the field or so on, eh? and then they will choose just to get it from the hatchery. But for those, some farmers are really like this system eh? uh, because it gives them more the feeling these chicks are born here. A big advantage, of course, is that there's no transport. Eh? So these chicks do not have to come from the hatchery. Eh? So that's because that can also be tricky, eh? sometimes uh, transport. Eh? Uh, so that's an advantage and eh? less stress. Eh? If you come into these houses with on-farm hatching, it's very quiet. They're, as I said, they pip, they rest and then they go along. It's there's little chicks, the sound they make, it is, you can make the difference between a stressed chick and a non-stress chick on, from the sound. And in those on-farm hatching, if everything is done well, eh? uh, of course you have to have the eating, all that perfect. Eh? But then it's very, with little stress. And, and that also, I think, is an advantage for the start of this baby chick. If you're using on-farm hatching, do you have to discard the eggshells or do those get used for bedding? Well, the eggshell, can stay in the house, but as I mentioned before, not the the ones that have a chick inside, eh? because it seems that in the eggshell, the the membranes, there is even substances that are enhancing also immune uh, the immune system. Eh? So it's it's good to leave it, uh, and uh, yeah, they get crushed and yeah, they can stay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So the, um, the gastrointestinal and the immune system development to me is really, really interesting. Um, if I know in the United States, there are some differences between here and Europe as far as how the eggs are handled before they get set. Um, are the eggs coming from the hens just laid directly with no washing and then they get put into the setter so they have the bloom intact? That's the idea. Eh? Uh, you should never put um, uh, floor eggs to hatch. Eh? Um, so what happens is they come from the breeder farm. And when in Belgium, at least, eh, our farms are close to the hatchery. Usually it's not that there's long transport and they will be collected three times a week eh, uh, from the farms. And when they come to the hatchery, that's when you disinfect them. Eh? They are usually in Belgium not disinfected at the farm um, because of this short distance and and, um, 
and um, that's when they are disinfected, sometimes stored, but usually used quite quickly yeah, uh, in the hatchery. And so disinfection is happening then when they enter the hatch before they go into the set. Yeah. Yes. So the um, the bird that's hatching that has an, an ability to interact with it with a clean eggshell maybe might get a different microflora from the environment than a bird that perhaps was, you know, incubated with a eggshell that wasn't washed. And those would give different opportunities for like gastrointestinal and immune development, wouldn't they not? Well, the, the washing eggs is is uh, not something that should be done. Um, so yeah. as, you, <laughs> as you said, you remove the cuticula, which is the natural protection. By washing the eggs, you make it more easily for pathogens to enter the egg. Uh, and they can, yeah. So that is what if you do wash them, that's the risk you will have that pathogens will spread in the hatcher, in the hatchery, and you will get cross-contamination between the different breeder farms, etc. So that's really, a hatchery is, is a funnel for pathogens. Uh, they come from different farms, you process them, and then you send them to uh, the different broiler farms. And so hatchery hygiene, biosecurity is really, really very important. Um, we used to say they clean with a toothbrush in the hatchery. <laughs> that clean it has to be. No, I understand why. <laughs> um, so can you tell me a little bit more about the, uh, basically the early access to feed and gastrointestinal development? That's a really interesting topic. Well, we've been talking a lot now about on-farm hatching. There's other ways of early feeding as well. Eh? Uh, so in yeah. fact, it starts with it's an opportunity, in my opinion, it is not yet done in, in practice. Eh? The first early feeding possibility is in ovo. Eh? So at transfer, 18 days, you could, eh? um, some researchers have been working on this for many, many years, uh, Peter Furkut and, and um, Zehava Yuni. Um, but in fact, until now, there's a lot of research going on, eh? uh, but it, I, I don't know of any uh, that is really done routinely in practice yet. Eh? There's a lot of possibilities, nutrients eh? uh, you could add, because the hatching process is a very, it, it asks a lot from the chick. Eh? It's, it's a big job eh? for the chick to get uh, born. Eh? Um, so maybe a bit of energy would be good. Um, there are other substances, um, maybe probiotics. I don't know. It's, of course, a very small volume that you can put there. Eh? Um, but the idea of this in ovo early feeding is that the chick, we, you have to put it in the onion so that the, the first meal that the chick is going to take in is that uh, fluid. Eh? So that's the idea of Innovo. Then on farm hatching is one, but you can also do early feeding in the hatcher eh, where you, eh, this, there are machines now, eh, and it's been again development in our, this part of the world. Eh, like the Netherlands have been working on this because they had a court case uh, where they said that the early feeding is really a welfare issue, which I don't think, eh? uh, because you, the, the chick has a natural backpack, eh? the, the yolk sac, that gives it um, feed and water for at least three days. Eh? So that's not really a welfare issue, I think, but okay. So now in the Netherlands, a judge has decided that uh, all the chicks need to have feed within 36 hours. Eh? So that's why they developed this machine. Eh? Uh, so in fact, the the trays are with the eggs are on a, a layer, and then when they get born, they fall underneath, and there they have on the sides there's water and feet that they can take in. The possibility, not sure how much they will really take in of that feed and water, but. It's a possibility they can, eh? yeah. Um, other 
early feeding can also be that when, as soon as they have hatched and they're in their, uh, or still in the hatchery, that you put a spray with a gel, like we, we um, do vaccines in the hatchery, yeah? but you can also use some kind of gel where you can put nutrients, you could put some um, uh, ions uh, like uh, salts or, well, uh, yeah, just to hydrate, eh? uh, glucose, um, probiotics, prebiotics, all that. Eh? You could, and the idea is that the little chick has a natural behavior of preening around eh? on, on his siblings. Eh? Um, and so they will pick it up and with the gel, Hey, watery drops, they just fall off and they cool down the chick. Hey, a watery, it's, it's, hey, whereas the gel doesn't cool them down and it stays longer. So in our experience also for coccidiosis vaccines and other vaccines, that's a very good way. Hey, but you can also use it for early feeding. No, because the, it, we, because you, I diverted to the other systems, but the importance of the development of the intestine, eh? we are chicks, you, well, the, 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 they grow fast eh? and their lifespan is always shorter. Eh? So we need, if we really want to go get most of the genetic potential, we have to get them to eat as soon as possible. Eh? And then the development of the gut, of course, is important. Eh? If you see at day 18, the gut is, there's almost nothing of, of the villi. Eh? And that comes very fast if you put something in there. It triggers the development of, of the villi. Eh? And you need those villi to be very sound and large surface for uh, absorption, of course. Eh? So the sooner you get that process started eh? for the development of the, the functional, eh? the, the morphology of the gut, eh? but also the... Um, the immune system. Eh? The sooner you trigger that, the sooner it starts to develop. Eh? And again, in some countries, they only grow chicks until, well, 25 days sometimes. Eh? So the sooner you get that whole system working, the better. Eh? What we also saw is that with the early feeding, eh? better development and sooner development of the gut, that some issues that we, intestinal health uh, issues that we see are like, for example, coccidiosis. Eh? We see, we did some trials and where we saw that you use less, that you have better development of immunity and less problems with coccidiosis in this, with this early feeding. And that is because your gut is better developed. Eh? Uh, and your immune system is working better. Not only the, the long term, but also the local uh, immunity is also better developed. Then. And another problem that we, eh, because there's another um, disease or syndrome, eh, um, the enterococci, uh, in enterococci, eh, which gives you um, locomotory problems when the birds get more heavy, eh? but in fact, this Enterococcus is an inhabitant of your intestinal tract, eh? and for some reason, it will become systemic. Eh? And then later, when the birds are more heavy, you get these abscesses or uh, femoral head necrosis or or those things. Eh? But if you can guarantee that the tight junctions are closing faster with this early feeding, you will have less problems with this kind of pathogens. It's not always 100%, but it helps. So one of the reasons to use antibiotics in the first days was this enterococcus pro problems. So we can partly avoid that with this new system. As I said, it's not 100%, but it helps. So if you just want to define the term early feeding, would you say there's a window within hatch that is optimal? Is it something like six hours, 
or is it 12 hours? Like, what would you say early feeding is just from a developmental standpoint? Well, you have your hatch window, eh? which is in, in hatch, you try to make it as small as possible. You want them all to hatch more or less together, but still it will be, eh? you they the first uh, to hatch will be if you transfer at 18 days, will maybe already be day 19. Eh? Uh, and then you have until day 21. Eh? So that's your hatch window. Eh? Um, in the house, it will be a little bit broader, but still at one stage you have to start taking out um, the, the, the non-hatch day eh? uh, because they will not hatch anymore. Eh? Yeah. But if you say how long can it take, eh? as in the Netherlands now they say, 36 hours, I think you can easily go. I'm, I'm saying for without harming welfare, eh? I would say 48 or even more, eh? but not more than three days. That is definitely eh? because that's how much backpack and, and reserve you have in the yolk sack eh? for. On the other hand, as I explained, eh, with the early feeding, the performance will be better. But I don't think it's really a welfare issue. But okay, that's the consumer will decide. <laughs> so then if you had to pick an optimal time basically for the bird to get feed right after it hatches, to get the performance and immune development benefits, what would you say the, win the kind of the window is to get those improvements? So how quickly does a bird need to get that heat? Well, as I, I mentioned, I think the way we do it in the conventional, you still have 12 hours before they get to the hatchery, from the hatchery to the farm, and that's fine. Once it gets more than 24 hours, it becomes more difficult, I think. to It's, in fact, what we see... Sometimes the, the, the parent stock, eh, they come from further away and they have more transport. There it can, like, we have to be careful, but we can still move them on a plane if, and, and that's perfectly possible. And eh? we've been doing it for many years. Eh? And, and I mean, I don't think that's an issue. So if you were to develop... Um, there probably are people working on this. I just don't know. But if you were to develop the best first food for a chick, what would you do? I'm just a vet, not a nutritionist. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned maybe some ideas about glucose or probiotics, and I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> well, I know like um, uh, uni, their group, they did uh, trials with uh, glutamine. Um, some, mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes it's uh, like the idea of the probiotic is that from the beginning you would start steering that microbiome, eh? which of course is also very important. Eh? Um, yeah, but as I say, there's a big list of products that have been tried, uh, used in trials to see what is the best and as I mentioned, I haven't seen any product yet used in in OVO. The first feed to give, I guess it will be some kind of small crumb. I mean, because it's what it, what is there, but it's also the 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 how can I say how it's made, eh? uh, how you present the first yeah. feed to the birds. Eh? Um, because in nature, the first thing they do, they, they just pick anything, little stones or little, and or right? and they learn what is food. So I guess that is also something that, as I said, this is not my expertise. You yeah. have to. <laughs> yes. Yes. There, I mean, there are well-formulated starter feeds, but I just thought the it, it could be interesting if there was something especially right after they hatch that just might give them a little more easier digestibility or was a you know a, a color they might be attracted to just because you mentioned they are looking to figure out what food is <laughs> yeah but but i'm sure there be and but i, I as i say i didn't um, i don't know all of it eh? um 
there are definitely special feeds like to put in the hatcher, right? It's not the same as a normal starter, I think. Yeah, also the 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 humidity, the the temperature in that hatcher is high. Right? No. So yeah, that's sorry, I can't answer your question. That's fine. Well, that's okay. I I sometimes have uh questions nobody can answer. <laughs> Um, so from from a health standpoint, if you're hatching birds on farm, um, as you mentioned, sometimes there are vaccines that are applied at the hatchery before they're sent. So does the farmer then become responsible for applying those first vaccines or does the vaccine regimen look different for those birds? Well, in principle, it doesn't look different. Some vaccines you can do in ovo then we have a good solution, I think, if you can do that. Some vaccines you can't do in all, right? So you will have to do them at the farm. That is, if you talk some disadvantage, can be more complicated eh? to vaccinate those birds. Eh? With a, you know, when they just hatched and, and you have to keep them, you will probably lose some vaccine. You have to be able to... But I see in the field farmers cope with that well or the vets cope with that see? Uh, to to at some point have them in one side and then go over with uh, maybe more than once uh, the machine yeah but that is uh, definitely if the vaccine done at the hatchery is probably more reliable right? also because okay, yeah <laughs> it's a vet fine if it has is if the farmer is doing it it's again an expertise that he will have to learn right? uh, because yeah before normally it's, it's done in that trick yeah? but that is then something yeah training education is also important so in your history with growing up with the family that raised and bred birds and then now as a consulting veterinarian what are some of the most interesting things or changes that have happened um, maybe that you expected or didn't expect like what what do you think has really gone on in the last you know 20 years of the poultry industry that has been really interesting to you well if, if i see the birds that i'm sure you've seen these pictures of the um uh, broilers we had 50 years ago and the ones we have now it's amazing how the genetics also have improved i mean we have such a performant uh, product. Um, it's the, the feed conversion rate has gone down to, well, more than half. Eh? Uh, in it's, it's really, we are very efficient. Eh? I think fish are maybe still more efficient to breed, but, but uh, chicken is, is fantastic. Eh? Um, also the, because we have a lot of uh, concern about the climate and, and so on. The ecologic footprint of poultry is, is also good. Um, we managed to breed them in a very efficient, uh, economic way. Um, so I think genetics is, is has been fantastic. And also, now sometimes some people criticize and say, I mean, here in Belgium, they talk about the plofkip. Uh, it's like a chicken that's going to explode because it's growing so fast. I really think this is, uh, um, there is still a need to feed the world. Uh, so we shouldn't be, of course, there's developments. Uh, I Like we see now in Europe, I'm sure also in the States, the slow growing breeds. So that is back to the future. We are going back to the lines that we, yeah. Okay, if people want that, fine. Is it good for the ecologic footprint? I don't think so. Because, yeah, we will need more feed to produce less meat. Um, but, yeah. yeah. So the, the genetic progress for me is, is very important. Eh? Um, has been very important. Also, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, but there also there's been a great evolution. Um, hey, like now we are, we started to ban the growth promoters in 2006 in Europe. 
we are now, and we we went through hard times to learn how to do this same with no growth promoters. And first, it led to more use of antibiotics. We didn't manage the the, the also with at the same time we had um, a vegetarian diet for chicken, and we we were not allowed to put uh, bone meal and so on. So we had to learn. But I think this. Uh, Together with the nutritionists, we've done a good job. Um, and we have all these alternatives for antibiotics that we are also learning to work with, which is also, I think, big progress has been made. They are also working on it in human medicine, but in poultry, I think we have made good progress in that sense. In the beginning, all these products were First of all, not very reliable or not always the same, Or but now we see reliable companies coming up with these alternative solutions that really can make a difference. Um, it will not be maybe one product, it will have to be a combination, but I think, um, yeah, this is, as far as innovation, I think also very exciting. And um, also the way, um, as I said, many changes in, in infrastructure, in um, the the way we vaccinate, the vaccines that we have has also been a big progress. Eh? Um, so I think, yeah, we have a lot of good tools to keep our birds healthy. Eh? Um, but yeah, um, there are still challenges. Eh? Uh, new diseases, uh, variants, uh, avian influenza that's hitting us everywhere hard. Eh? Um, so, yeah, we're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the world keeps things interesting for the poultry industry. Um, what are some of the major changes that you've seen in hatcheries that have improved livability or just the way, you know, we raise birds? It, it seems uh, I do the least work in hatcheries, but it seems like there have been incredible changes, especially like you mentioned, the vaccinators in ovo vaccination, um, which might make your job a little easier. <laughs> well, I'm not so t about the new techniques, eh? but I do know that the, the whole process in the hatchery is constantly improving. Eh? Um, the, these companies that make... Uh, these uh, machines and also and and all that uh, are very performant. If you think that from Belgium, the people that uh, make a hatchery or deliver a hatchery in in Africa, they have a system that they can look what's going on, and they can help the people without having to go there. I mean that's fantastic. Eh? Uh, it's a big improvement. <laughs> um, then. Also in the hatchery, there are the innovations are both for performance and like uh, new ways to take out the non-fertiles uh, based on different techniques that I don't really know, but I know they are more performing than they used to be um, automated. Um, and then also adaptations to improve biosecurity and welfare also in the hatchery and because there's the life of the chick starts there and to be honest eh, the, that process in the hatchery is very intense they go to a whole machine thing and to get um, counted and then yeah, sometimes they also have to be sexed but I mean all that constantly people are trying to improve so yeah, I I think also in the hatchery, um, <laughs> sorry, now like in Belgium, we've been a bit behind with the Innovo, but now it's starting, everybody is looking at it and more and more will use it because it goes nicely together with the on-farm hatching, of course. Eh? Uh, but also it's a very good technique to, to inject each bird. Eh? Every egg gets his injection, eh? Those machines also have, I think maybe that's also one of the reasons why the Innovo feeding has not been, 
performed because the machines were not good enough. Now there's machines that, in fact, turn the egg towards the needle or, well, it's all very performing. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, also in the hatchery, there's a lot of improvement. Also in the disinfection, we used to um, use a lot of formalin, eh, which is bad for people, but also not so good for the chicks. Eh? Um, so we are having new techniques there, new products um, in that area. Eh? Disinfection, cleaning, uh, also is there's a lot of improvements there. Yeah, that, um, what you said exactly at the beginning is that the poultry industry is doing very well at prevention. It really shows in the technology that's been developed. Yeah, well, we have to, eh? as I said, a big flock. Eh? Sometimes flocks are now 100,000 or when they're sick, it's too late. Eh? And we are under pressure not to use antibiotics, so you need to prevent. Yeah, And all these viruses where we have no medicine for, you have to vaccinate. Yeah. Is there anything else on the topic before we go into the three questions that we ask every guest? Is there anything else that you need to say <laughs> that we've talked about? Well, I do believe that eh, as I'm really saw this progress eh, uh, in in genetics, that we have to be proud, but also keep the the possibility, and eh, because like the slow growing is good and everything, uh, but. We need to feed the world. Eh? I spent quite some time uh, living in Africa, for example. I visited countries in Asia. Um, I think that we should make the best of what we have in this chicken genetic potential. Eh? Uh, okay, if some consumers want something else, okay, but we should still be able to keep this very performing Ross Cop uh, standard. The rest is a bit luxury uh i yeah i really like that viewpoint i appreciate that um so the three questions that we ask every guest i will ask you uh what is your favorite poultry related book well of course there's the bible of the poultry diseases eh, which is very technical eh? but then i really like also because we were part in writing them eh, the poultry signal books which we, the last one we contributed to was the African edition for the broiler signals, which is really adapted more to this continent and conditions. And But it's very, for education, it's very good for, for farmers, for vet technicians and to, to these are very, um, nice books, I think, eh? with a lot of pictures, tables, checklists. Uh, yeah, very, very practical. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds perfect for different uses. Um, what is your favorite book uh, outside of agriculture? I know it sounds dull, eh? James Harriet. And then Quentin. But to relax, <laughs> I read these books eh, from the All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, because I did have a life before I was a poultry vet. Eh? I did treat cattle, dogs, cats, and all that. So it's it's very relaxing, I must say. I can still read them again and again. Eh? Also, the interaction with the people uh, in in the countryside and and people with pets. Also, it's yeah, that's okay. Now. <laughs> I love that. Um, so uh, your the last question is, in your opinion, what sets successful poultry professionals apart from those that are not? I think you have to stay on top of and, and be willing to continuously learn and see what is new and adapt. And that's, I think, what poultry industry is quite good at also. Right? Um, a successful farmer has to be dedicated to his birds. He has to be attentive. He has to be 
looking at them. That's um, when we talk about these poultry signals, that's really important. Eh? And then, of course, he is a businessman. Eh? He also has to keep on top of evolution and uh, new techniques for the, the feed, the, the um, uh, biosecurity, all that. So, yeah, I think people in the poultry profession need to keep up. Well, it's probably the same in, in a lot of other uh, disciplines, eh? but you have to, yeah, keep keep uh, in touch with uh, what's going on, um, yeah, and be proud of what you do, I think. I think we have a nice industry that can do a lot of good things, eh? and sometimes we, we are criticized and we should, well, show what is what we do is good and like this new on farm hatching is really a, a nice thing yeah well it has been really exciting and enriching talking to you today about this um some of the uh the early feeding i i know about and some of the things you talked about today i are were new and really interesting so i'm really happy that um people are working on this because it's such an interesting area and I also appreciate that you can bring in, uh, you know, production, how the farmer will interact with the system as well as welfare and some of these other aspects, because we can never forget the functions got on fit, you know, uh, with some of the other goals of the system. So thank you again. This has been been really great. And I think the listeners will have learned quite a bit from our chat today. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> 